Welcome friends to Chaoticism. The superior first-person shooter Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl boasts an impressive arsenal of obscure and unique weapons and armor to fit its sci-fi setting. In Stalker, guns are willed into existence by a higher power. But unlike the common trope of colored text to denote rarity or uniqueness, GSC went with a little green arrow to set upgraded variants apart from their common counterparts. But since Shadow of Chernobyl doesn't have an upgrade system, guns with these arrows are generally unique. These unique attributes come in the form of increased magazine capacities, modified fire rates, integrated suppressors, and armor capable of increasing your already ridiculous ability to carry loads of bullshit. All weapons and armor in the game except the knife have a durability bar that, when depleted, leaves your weapon utterly unusable. Under normal circumstances, this means that all uniques have a finite lifespan. For the rules of this run, they are pretty basic. Firstly, we can only use unique weapons and armor. For the purposes of this run, a unique item is one that has a green arrow or only has one existence in the game, like the knife or Martha pistol. Second, we can only have one set of armor and two guns with us at a time, so no hoarding. For an added bonus, we may only equip one of each artifact to help us, as Shadow of Chernobyl's artifacts are super useful. And once again, we're playing on master difficulty and going for the true ending, because any less is for pussies. Starting out, we sell our leather jacket and run off to start the fight between the loners and bandits to rescue our boy Nimble. We put on the mail jacket hidden inside a tunnel behind the bandit encampment and head off to the railroad embankment. A slimy soldier here has a unique pistol, the Fort 15. Thankfully, he's too busy trying to shake us down to see my knife plunge into his face. We return to help out Nimble and kill the bandits like normal. After returning the flash drive, we head off to the garbage. We successfully save Yurik and talk to Bess to help him fend off the invading bandits. But this is a lesson in trust. Don't trust the guy wearing bandit armor to help you kill bandits. We take Bess's unique rifle that has an integrated suppressor, which completes our early game loadout. In the fight to save Sadie, we get shredded by a sneaky bandit but came out on top the second time around. In Agriprom, I ran in the front doors like a twat and immediately got clapped by the superiorly armed soldiers, so my next approach was to go around and hit them from behind. I climbed on the rooftops and got the literal drop on them. Once Mole was saved from the soldiers in the courtyard, he was almost immediately killed by the soldiers who diverted from killing the loners on the front line. This saved me from killing Mole myself, however, as he has his own unique pistol, but it was crap compared to the Fort 15, so I left it to be buried with him. The Agriprom Underground was much easier than my shotgun only challenge, as I had an automatic weapon and an ice pistol. So I failed my first firefight with the bandits for good luck and headed down to the Bloodsucker Pit. Because I gained a whole 1 IQ after my last challenge run, I simply bypassed the mutant after getting the guaranteed urchin artifact and managed to get up and out of Strelik's hideout with little resistance from the soldiers here. Before I left, I replaced my primary with the incredible fast shooting AKM. I'll give you one guess at what its special attribute is. That's right, it has increased recoil compensation for help in the laying of waste upon your unfortunate foes. My next task was to steal the documents from the military base, so I strapped on a suppressor to my Fort 15 and tried to crawl in the back window, but like a rookie burglar, I set off every alarm as I carelessly clambered around. This caused me to initiate Plan B, titled The Zoomies. I sprinted off to the third floor and tore through the two soldiers up here and made it out before anyone could register what happened. The mail jacket I still had on was no more than a Kevlar weaved garbage bag, so I had to plan for my next set of armor. I'll explain more when that time comes, but right now I needed a Nightstar artifact that spawns in the southeast corner of Agriprom. Sometimes it spawns outside of the map boundary, but we lucked out. After picking it up, I fell into the ultimate noob trap a shiny object just beyond an anomaly. Yeah, I'm dumb, so I had to steal the documents all over again. After escaping Agriprom with the documents and Night Star in hand, I had to get past the group of bandits I avoided from before. In my first attempt, I tried to brute force my way through, but it ended in failure as I had no medkits to call upon the magic of the F1 key. I then had to do this little thing called look before you leap and notice the bandits were unaware of my presence. I used the trees to sneak by them and stealth killed two of them in my way before making my daring escape. The duty ears at the checkpoint didn't even need to look at the future of my YouTube channel to determine that I was trash, yet let me through to the bar anyway. It's no secret that Shadow of Chernobyl was plagued with a rough development cycle. 
This led to some questionable things being left in the game with no purpose and caused the average player to question the meaning behind them. Three of these items are the guitar, hand underscore radio, and bread. Only the most chadliest of stalkers carry a guitar, so obviously we're going to take it with us. And though we already possess an antenna inside our head other stalkers of the zone use to communicate with us, we're packing the hand underscore radio too. The bandit base was nothing to write home about, but I managed to get clapped by the first bandit twice before being able to make it atop the building and dive into the second floor window. From here I fought my way to the roof. I tried to use the tactic of peeking in the window to shoot Borov and some of his guys, but the bachelor pad was empty, so I had to use the stairs. After slaughtering enough bandits to feed a herd of bloodsuckers, I got in and killed Borov, taking his key and three loaves of questionable bread. Those of you who watched my previous run know I am notorious for finding every burner anomaly in the game, yet I managed to pull through X-18 without getting cooked. One thing I want to mention is I took the underbarrel grenade launcher off the AKM in the locker room and attached it to our already overpowered fast shooting AKM. The pseudo giant looks like a troll and acts like one too. Every attempt to blow him up with explosive barrels resulted in him hitting them back to me like a deadly game of tennis. I gave up not wanting to waste my precious durability like the failure I am. Killing the pyrogeist and escaping were rather standard, except for the poltergeist that got owned by the military, giving me a free kill near the top. Now was the time to upgrade my armor. We used the southern exit of the dark valley to teleport to the cordon and return to Sodorovich. We turned in the jellyfish, stone flower, meat chunk, and nightstar artifacts from his string of fetch quests for a unique armor called the Taurus suit. This baby increases our unhampered carry weight from an insane 50 kilograms to a superhuman 70 kilograms. With new levels of strength and irresistible masculinity, we headed on to our next objective, rescuing Kruglov. The mercenaries in the wild territory were powerless ants beneath a magnifying glass. And to further increase our power level, we made a quick trip to our boy Gordon Freeman, who had next to him the most powerful gun in the game. The Big Ben is essentially a desert eagle chambered in a wrist-breakingly large armor-piercing rifle cartridge. Damn! We won't be using it until later though, but that didn't matter due to the sheer power of the fast-shooting AKM. We tossed aside our Fort 15 and headed back to the surface. With a shotgun, this escort mission feels like purgatory, but with a rifle, it might as well be daycare. I got game ended by the fastest gun in the east, but made it to the underpass on my second attempt. I witnessed the personification of my previous challenge run in the underpass, but I was undeterred and pushed on to Yantar. Collecting the measurements for the Psy helmet was easy. I swatted zombies like flies, but in an attempt to give Krugel of a superior gun to his Viper 5, I ended up inadvertently killing him due to the collision between his hitbox while downed and the dropped weapon. With Goofy's Psy helmet on head, I made a direct line for X-16. Failing to get the recording off the body of the dead scientist in the lake caused both Sakharov and his audio to play at once, causing an annoying overlap of voice lines in my ear. I managed to clear X-16 without any deaths. Our old homie Ghost had a unique suit on him, which we switched to due to our tourist suit being in pretty bad shape, and the ability to survive bullets was more necessary than carrying an extra 40 pounds of gear. A surprising amount of forethought was had by me at this point. No armor would protect us in the endgame better than an exoskeleton, and there was only one unique variant to be found. Our brother from another mother, Fang, who was also dead by the way, carried on him a unique exoskeleton, which would be necessary to ensure our survival. Unfortunately, this suit was in a stash, and stash coordinates are randomly received. In order to get this suit, we needed to get the coordinates off stalkers in Yantar, but for some reason, no one showed up to the party after turning off the miracle machine. I thought I needed to wait a little more time, so I went off to talk to Guide and Doc, but upon returning to Yantar, there was still nothing but zombies roaming around. I thought this was it. I expected to have to push on with maybe the healing barrel suit, but the stalker wiki showed me a light at the end of the tunnel. There existed a dead stalker in the escape tunnel from X-16 who can give you coordinates to the stash we needed. With luck and a little bit of harmless abuse, we earned ourselves the Fang's goodie stash, easing my troubled mind and solving a future problem. Our next objective was to get our endgame tool. The fast shooting AKM is amazing, but not against armored enemies, so we needed an upgrade with a little more accuracy and damage. 
The only weapon that came to mind was the Sniper TRS. In the Army warehouses, there is a mercenary camp in the northwest corner that contains this gun. It has an integrated suppressor, a scope that has little zoom despite being modified for snipers, and a slower automatic fire rate for consistent shots where you want them. On the way to the mercenary camp, I paid respects to Wolf and drank a bottle of vodka in his honor. For some reason, he always finds himself in this fire pit during my playthroughs. Ditching my beloved AKM was hard, but a necessary change. We needed to move on to bigger and better things. Though the times were hard and the troubles were fun, success was our only goal, but I'm hardly the expert on achieving that. I thought an underbarrel grenade launcher would be necessary in winning, so I went to the only place that came to mind to get one, the Freedom Armory. There exist two legitimate methods of getting in here, killing the guard or befriending Freedom, or jumping over the guy, but I suck at that. Since siding with freedom is a beta male move and literally stupid because the central hub of the game is duty territory, we went with the bloodthirsty approach. Intentional or not, thanks to GSE's forethought on this dilemma, they provided explosive barrels you can use to kill anyone you wish without having ward declared on you. A trial was presented before me, getting the barrels up the stairs, but I had done this dozens of times before, so it only took me 5 minutes to get both barrels up to kill the guard. After claiming my prize, I also noticed the unique freedom suit in the armory. I forgot about it as I have never worn a freedom suit on principle, but I swallowed my pride and put it on due to its superior stats to the ghost suit. The entrance to the red forest gave me false hope for my future. The monolith here could not comprehend the sheer dome checking power I possessed. Proceeding into the red forest was just as fun as everyone fell before my pinpoint might. Unfortunately for the Brain Scorcher, I didn't get the element of surprise and had to fight my way into the lab. Being so close to enemies was dangerous as nailing a headshot was difficult when they moved and the reduced field of view could be disorienting. Getting down to the Brain Scorcher controls was easy as always, but thinking about escaping gave me flashbacks to my many deaths during my shotgun only run. I had a lot of fun running one of my favorite games from my childhood in challenge format. I knew that stealth would be my only way to succeed, and since the sniper TRS had a suppressor, that it would be easy. Unfortunately for me, I was about to experience what the adult film industry calls changing lanes without signaling. Killing the first guy was free, as he was consistently oblivious. The guy around the corner, however, was always a hard stopper, as he was quick to react. The next three guys were also a breeze once I learned the pattern. I could shoot the furthest guy through a small opening, and no one would notice. The guy up on the near catwalk was second, and the asshole on the furthest catwalk who usually saw me was third. My first time through the next room ended with me getting blasted as I fruitlessly attempted to flee the cone of death a shotgun in an NPC's hands produced. My next run, I got ambushed at the very beginning from behind by a guy I swore I had killed. Apparently, however, a monolith soldier spawns in the brain scorcher control room when you wake up that I never knew about. He had to be clapped every time I reloaded a save, which was a mild inconvenience to already dying. The next room that gave me anxiety was this small single light corner room, with the shotgun guy slowly walking towards me. If I was quick enough, he would be really far behind so I could scare or kill the first dude. The exoskeleton monolith were the bane of my existence. They could tank multiple shots to the head, which made killing them slightly luck based on whether or not they would hit me. Unfortunately, looking through the scope of a rifle made you oblivious to how dead you were, causing you to break your sight picture whenever you wanted to check your vitals. It took me four painstaking tries to get through this one room, which is over half my attempts. In the next open area, I tried to sneak around. Walking and crouch walking still make a little bit of sound, alerting this guy, who was standing just on the other side of the crates I was crawling around, giving me quite the horror element this lab lacked compared to the other two. My hubris was the death of me, as my first time making it this far caused me to be careless. What's up, fuckers? I entered the threshold of the doorway to the stairs and immediately got skinned like a tater, a mistake I would not make again. In the elevator room after the staircase, I had a long butt-clenching battle with some sneaky monolith. I got pinned down in a corner room, but I began thinking like the enemy and managed to catch him while he reloaded. The monolithian countered with wall hacks that took a few medkits from me but ultimately, I came out on top. I had a close cheeky breaky moment near the end where a monolith popped out while I was in a narrow hallway, but I persevered and managed to peekaboo my way through the end. I wiped the sweat from my taint after that ordeal. 
I abandoned the loners like usual and made my way to the courtyard that held Fang's grave. I was being heavily pinned down by monolith in the area, but managed to raid the stash through sheer brute force and impatience. The only thing unique about this exoskeleton was that it had a generation 2 night vision, which was an awesome upgrade as it didn't give you violent disorientation compared to gen 1 NVGs. Unfortunately, I had to drop the second set of mama's beads due to the bonus rule. Upon getting the decoder, I beelined it to the stadium and teleported my way to the CN PP. Getting into the big CN PP was pretty stock standard, except for the time I fell into an anomaly like a dunce. I could not get out due to the exoskeleton's inability to sprint. I finally pulled out my Big Ben for the CNPP interior. The voice in my head, however, still told me my wiener was small, and according to the stats on the gun, its accuracy was abysmal. But in the wise words of Mia Khalifa, there is such thing as too small, just be confident. It's all about the way you treat a girl. So we were going to treat these monolith like utter human filth. My tactic was perfect as I was getting head shots left and right. The room of death was little more than a speed bump, as the choke point that was the hole in the wall gave me easy headshots, clearing the room in record time. My run through this area seemed perfect, except for when I failed to kill a monolith whose buddy came around the corner and ended me as I took cover. This is why you don't get too focused on one guy. My second run went flawlessly, where I again hid in the corner as I waited for the decoder to work its magic. The hallways from hell. I remember this place well. But with a weapon that was built for long corridors, I felt confident, until I got shot from behind. Again, I was fighting a battle on all sides. I had to constantly keep an eye over my shoulder, looking for threats to kill. Attempting to run into the next room ended with me getting blasted away, so I had to eliminate all I could from my little hidey hole. Popping out and shooting down one hallway too long netted me a few new holes in the back, as monolith were constantly moving into flanking positions. But a long game of peekaboo later, I had gained enough kills to safely move ahead. I got stopped at the second corner just before the longest hallway, but a little bit of patience was all that was needed to get me through. The longest hallway had a few guys at the end who just let me take their lives with no resistance. The shots were hard to line up due to the nearly zero zoom the scope on my, again, sniper TRS gave me, but they all ended up dead and I moved on. The final room before the exterior gave me a chance to use the remainder of my underbarrel grenades. Using three grenades to alleviate the monolith zealots from their mind control was satisfying and left the room in near wasteland. After doming the remaining monolith and destroying the electrical nodes in the last room, I was outside the CNPP once again. Climbing around the CNPP was mostly unremarkable until the end. I got blown up once by an RPG while atop the power plant, but it wasn't until the last section that gave me true trouble. Killing a few monolith and waddling my way to the final ladder was tedious at best, but a sneaky teleporting RPG guy got me, again. Oh my god! Planning for him my next attempt got me atop the ladder, but I was too slow to make it to the portal before six monolith teleported in and tossed me like a salad. For my winning attempt, I ditched my exoskeleton at the top of the ladder and ran naked into the portal, completing Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl with only unique items. I'm going to be quite honest, I thought this run would be more difficult due to the ever dwindling durability of unique items. But GSC wanted you to enjoy them so most uniques have greatly increased durability. Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section below and drop a like if you felt entertained. I would love to hear your opinion on how I can improve. Thank you and I hope your next date with that cute boy, girl or building for all you objectophiliacs out there goes well.